Welcome to Baptist Fellowship. We're glad that you joined us again online this week. Uh, we are finishing off January uh, with a cold snap here in Connecticut. We hope that if you're joining us from warmer places that you'll keep us in mind and keep us in your prayers. Uh, we are going to get started this morning with a word of prayer and then we're going to spend some time in worship uh, and then come back for a uh, time in the Word. So let's go before the Lord and ask Him to bless our time this morning. Father in heaven, we are grateful for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. Lord, as we spend some time in worship this morning, I pray, God, that you would warm our hearts and, Lord, help us to draw close to you. Thank you to Kathy and to Judy, Lord, uh, for their ministry of music this morning. And may we join them in worshiping you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, I hope that you enjoyed uh, joining with us in worship this morning. Again, I want to give my thanks to both Judy and Kathy for participating, and also some other people who uh, work very hard behind the scenes. Um, as Sandy Caldwell usually does some of the filming, and Wendell, of course, is instrumental in making sure uh, that it gets recorded and that the sound levels are good. So I want to just give a thanks to those people as we engage in online worship for now as we are awaiting the opportunity to rejoin as a church and gather in person. Uh, it's really important that people who have those kind of gifts uh, are generous with their time and so I just want to pass along uh, my thanks to Wendell and to Sandy this morning uh, for all that they have done to help keep online church a reality. Also uh, Sandy is very diligent about making sure uh, that children's programs are up and running uh, and she's been doing that all year for Awana. If you haven't checked that out, I'd just encourage you to do that. Um, we do have many Awana programs available uh, online, and so I believe you can check those out. And if even if you don't have kids, it's good to just see what she's been up to. So I want to give Sandy a word of thanks. Now let's go before the Lord and spend a little bit of time in prayer as we prepare our hearts for the sermon this morning. Father in heaven, I'm grateful for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. Lord, as we take some time now to lift our hearts to you, we pray uh, that you'll be with us. Father, as we finish out this month and begin the next, Lord, I pray that you will give us a sense of anticipation, a sense of hope, and a sense of forbearance in the midst of the circumstances in which they're in. Uh, Father, we all are hoping that we can soon uh, rejoin in-person services. So, Father, I just pray that you will work out the details so that we can do that and we can do it safely. Lord God, I thank you for uh, the reopening task force and for their guidance. Uh, Father, I pray that as we consider this week what it might look like for us to reassemble in small groups and to orchestrate that and organize that, Lord, that you would give us wisdom. And I am uh, particularly thankful to both Kathy Arts and Renee Gaucher, uh, for their wisdom as they provide us with many details about uh, medical information that we wouldn't have otherwise know. And so, Lord God, I just thank you for that and pray uh, that you'll be with them. And Father, I pray for many of the people who continue to be affected by uh, the coronavirus in a professional way. Lord, obviously, we lift up a Renee to you as she's on the front lines in emergency room nursing. Father, I also play, pray that you'll be with, uh, with Judy Rana who has had to pick up extra shifts because of coronavirus and people falling ill. And Lord God, last I heard, there were even times in which she was working seven days. Uh, so Father, I pray uh, per week, Lord, that you'll just be with her, that you lift her up, that you give her a sense of, of your peace in the midst of her work, and Lord, give her extra energy. And God, I pray that soon she'll be able to find some rest in the midst of that. Lord God, I pray that you'll be with everyone who has lost someone uh, because of COVID-19. And Lord, there are a number from our church, but we also know of people outside of our church, Lord, uh, who have lost loved ones. And so, Father, I just pray, God, that you would bring relief to their hearts, uh, salve their souls in the midst of their time of grief. And Father, I pray that after we begin to reassemble as a church, Lord, that you might help us find ways uh, to minister to those who are grieving in a way that we can bring healing and also bring glory uh, to the name of your Son. Lord God, I pray that as we open the word this morning, Lord God, that you'd speak to us, uh, that you will help us to understand in the words of this book uh, how we can draw closer to your Son, Jesus, how we can cultivate the relationship that we have with you. And ultimately, Lord God, our prayer is that we would be found faithful as a church, preaching uh, the words of your book, holding high the name of Jesus Christ, proclaiming the gospel uh, that he came to bring, and honoring you in all that we do and say. And I pray these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. We are going to continue in our sermon series through the book of Acts. Uh, we started that basically sometime last year, and are continuing now after we've spent some time and over the holidays, preaching about the person of Jesus Christ and his advent. And now that we have returned to a more regular preaching calendar, we're going to continue on to the book of Acts, and I'm going to be preaching this week out of the 15th and 16th chapters of the book of Acts. So if you want to open your phone 
or open your Bible uh, to that passage. Acts chapter 15, I'm going to start in verse 30. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to uh, go through and remind us about where we've been so far. Uh, the book of Acts starts off, of course, uh, with Jesus present with his disciples, speaking to them uh, the words of truth. He had been with them for 40 days after his resurrection, prior to his being ascended to the right hand of the Father. And the last words that the book of Acts records of Jesus, the last words that Luke, who was uh, the person who wrote bo both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, records Jesus saying, is that they are to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And because of that, the book of Acts follows very closely those words that Jesus spoke that they would be disciples in Jerusalem. And so when Peter preaches, he preaches in Acts chapter 2, the very first sermon that creates the institutional church is done in Jerusalem. That, of course, is what we celebrate when we look at the Feast of Pentecost and how the Holy Spirit came and interpreted Peter's words to those who spoke in a different tongue so that they could understand in their own tongue. And, of course, the church began to expand and explode in the number of people who were joining it from that point as the gospel radiated from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. And then we're getting to the point now where it's beginning to impact the uttermost parts of the earth. Peter was the first person to preach to a Gentile audience when he came to Cornelius' house and explained to them the gospel. And as a result of that, a number of different questions arose about the place of the Gentiles in the kingdom of God and what the kingdom of God is going to look like on earth given the fact that Gentile customs and Jewish customs were very different. And so the controversy that was addressed that I preached on last week in Acts chapter 15 had everything to do with whether or not Gentiles needed to be circumcised in order to continue in the church. And the result was that Peter stood up and explained what had happened at Cornelius' household and how the Holy Spirit had fallen upon them once they had believed. And his assessment is actually very accurate, that he believed uh, that he and the rest of the Jewish people would be saved exactly as Cornelius and his house were saved by grace through faith apart from works. And then James stood up and said it seemed best to him through the Holy Spirit, to lay only a few requirements upon the Gentiles. And we see a recounting of that in Acts uh, chapter 15, starting in verse 28, where the Bible says, For it has seemed good to me, or for it has seen, seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well, farewell. And the sermon that I'm going to preach today is following on that decision. In verse 30, uh, this is the text for this morning, and these are the words of the Lord. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of the encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with him John called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul also came to Derbe in Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, 
And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches there were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. This is the word of the Lord in our hearing. Now, in this particular passage, it's a very narrative passage. It's a historical account of what happened after the Jerusalem Council, which is uh, the event when all of the apostles came together to consider uh, the requirements of the Gentiles as they began to become a significant part of the faith, of the way, of the Church of Christ as they were coming to faith. And in many ways, this passage just gives us some historical account of what happened, but there are a couple of events, a couple of key events in the life of Paul, specifically in the life of Paul and Barnabas, and then Paul as he goes on his way to Derby and Lystra, that are very important for the development of the rest of the New Testament. And the first one is this situation in which Paul and Barnabas have a stark disagreement, a sharp disagreement over the inclusion of John Mark into the ministry, into the trip that Paul was planning. See, according to the Bible and what we just read, Paul had spoken to Barnabas and suggested that they go on a trip to revisit all of the churches where they had preached the word of the Lord and to strengthen them and to encourage them. And Barnabas had a cousin, he had a relative named John Mark, who he wanted to bring along, but there was a problem. Uh, John Mark had withdrawn in Pamphylia. He had not gone to the work. He had reserved. Perhaps he was afraid of the persecutions uh, that they could have faced. Perhaps there was some other reason that kept him uh, from doing what Paul believed he should have been doing at the time. And because of that, Paul and Barnabas had a what's called a sharp disagreement. The, the word that it's translated means they had a very difficult, stark, they had a sharp disagreement between uh, the two of them. And as a result of that disagreement, Paul and Barnabas ended up separating. Barnabas taking John a mark with him in one direction and Paul going in a different direction. And what's interesting about that is, is it shows uh, that there are times in the life of the disciples in which even they can't disagree. They weren't perfect men. Uh, they weren't perfect people. And because of that, uh, they had to struggle with the kinds of disagreements that we dis that we as believers and as individuals uh, have even within our own lives. And there are times in which we can't resolve these things and we must make a decision to grant the best and depart company. But what I find interesting is that later on in Paul's life, as he is ruminating on what it means for the Church of Christ to be one and for brothers and sisters to get along and to dwell in unity, he gives the following advice in the Holy Spirit. We see this in Acts. I'm sorry, in Romans chapter 12, if you have a Bible, if you'll turn with me to Romans chapter 12, we're going to see toward the end of Paul's life the advice that he will give to other believers about how to handle situations and disagreements. Romans chapter 12, starting in the ninth verse, Paul writes this, Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
Paul's synopsis of what he just said is not to be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. Now, I don't believe that the situation that we see in Acts chapter 16 is actually Paul acting contrary to the advice that he would later give. I believe, and this is just my interpretation and my opinion and others differ, but when Paul and Barnabas decided to separate, that they had talked it out as much as possible, and the sharp disagreement that they had, this, this noted difference of opinion, the stark dif difference of opinion uh, that they had could not be resolved. And so in my opinion, they shook hands, they parted ways, and they gave a mutual blessing. And that sometimes is what we have to do when we find that we have disagreements with brothers and sisters in Christ. But what isn't called for is for us when we have differences with brothers and sisters in Christ to behave the way that the world handles conflict. Because the way that the world handles conflict is not at all in accordance with what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12. Let me give, just remind us of a few of the highlights that we see in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans about how we're to treat other people, especially those people with whom we have significant difference. The first one is this, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. So the question that we have to ask ourselves as potential disagreements creep into our lives is in the midst of that disagreement, can we still allow our love to be genuine, even for people that we disagree with? How about this? Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Now see, that has to be one of the most challenging statements that I believe that Paul has made. It's not that we are just to bless people who bless us. In fact, Jesus has said in the Gospels, you know, if you are kind to those who are kind to you, what good is that to you? Everybody does that. Even the Gentiles can do that, he says. Even people who don't have a relationship with God can show kindness to people who show kindness to them. But rather, pray for those who persecute us and to do good to those who would do evil towards us is the consistent revelation of how we are to treat people throughout the biblical witness. It's true in the life of Jesus and in his words. And it's reflected again in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans when Paul says, Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. That has to be a challenge. And it certainly is a challenge in everyday conflicts. But as we start to see the world and conflict in the world heating up in a pretty observable way, it's important for us as believers to make sure that we're behaving towards outsiders, those who don't have a relationship with Christ, in a way that brings honor and glory and testimony to the gospel that we believe in. And it's also important as brothers and sisters in Christ that we present to the world a picture of what it means to live in harmony with one another. See, unfortunately, the age in which we're in right now, the last couple of years, and uh, perhaps it's been the last five or six, maybe even the last decade, we've noticed that brothers and sisters in Christ have uh, grown to become divided on some pretty important issues. And those issues are issues that not only are just out there, they're not necessarily just esoteric matters of doctrine. In many ways, they impact us in our lives and what we deeply believe about contemporary issues. And certainly among those are political issues uh, that we've seen creeping into the church, uh, at least in this last election, election cycle and perhaps the one before. And those temporary conflicts can often distract us as Christians from the eternal kingdom that we are members of. And I would much rather use whatever influence that I can have over people, whatever opportunity to speak in the lives of people uh, that I have. Because I recognize that when people hear me speak, when they tune in on YouTube, when they come to the church, when they invite me into their homes uh, through YouTube or through Facebook, uh, that that's an opportunity for me to speak into their lives. And if any opportunity I have to speak into someone's life, I want to be utilized to build up the kingdom of God rather than the kingdoms of men. And so in the midst of this, while I believe people can have very 
poignant and stark disagreements about political issues, like Paul and Barnabas had stark differences about an approach about whether to bring John Mark along. I would much rather spend time practicing Romans chapter 12 so that people can become more attracted to the person of Jesus Christ and to his kingdom. Which is why verse 15, I believe, and forward is very important. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one for evil, for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And this verse, which I think summarizes everything that he said before, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. As much as it depends on me, my responsibility is to live at peace with all. And that means my brothers and sisters in Christ who may disagree with me on some political issues, and also those who are outside the church, uh, to the extent that I can be agreeable uh, without compromising my own conscience and without dishonoring God. And so I think the one thing that we can take from this narrative in Acts chapter 15 uh, that is important to the way that we live life on an everyday basis is how we handle conflict. You see, I'm not convinced that Paul and Barnabas handled that particular disagreement perfectly, but I believe that they handled it much more honorably than a lot of people handle disagreements. It didn't say that they had a shouting match. It doesn't say that they left angry. It just said that they had a sharp difference of opinion. And instead, because they could not reconcile the two approaches, they parted ways and I believe gave their mutual blessing and went on to accomplish the work. However, it did give Paul an opportunity uh, to minister in a very different way. So he took Silas with him and went to Lystra and Derby and found a young man who was well thought of by the apostles in that area by the name of Timothy. And Timothy, he took under his wing and began to mentor him. And what's important about this time in Paul's life is it's the beginning, it's a fostering of a relationship uh, that Paul will expand upon later. In fact, if you'll turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy, we'll read some of the words that Paul has to his amanuensis, to his protege. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, we read this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. You can even hear the affection that Paul has in his voice that Timothy is someone who had become very dear to Paul. Paul writing from prison uh, towards the end of his ministry on earth writes to his protege Timothy with this great deal of respect and admiration and affection because of the opportunity that handling this conflict gave Paul to build into the lives of others. And in fact, what Paul will then say in 2 Timothy to Timothy is that he wants his protege to begin to build into the lives of others in the same way that Paul had ministered and mentored and built into the life of Timothy. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, we read this. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in sufferings as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlists him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Now, the illustrations that Paul gives to Timothy are twofold. The first one is 
Actually, there's threefold. There's three particular illustrations that Paul uses when he seeks to exemplify his point. And one of them is an example of a farmer. He's like, if you're a farmer and you're working hard, you need to be able to share in the bounty of the crops. The second illustration he gives is in an athlete. The athlete needs to work hard in order to be able to run, to win, to be able to compete in a way that is serious. And the third example that Paul gives, the third illustration that I want to point to, is the illustration of the soldier. And the soldier, he says, does not involve himself in civilian pursuits, but rather seeks to obey and to carry out the orders of the officers who have enlisted him. And that's the illustration that I really want to carry forward as we connect this point to the previous point. See, the reality of the matter is that Paul is trying to tell Timothy that there are all sorts of things that we can get entangled in in this world. There are all sorts of opinions, all sorts of agendas, all sorts of movements that we can find ourselves invested in. But when we do that, we have to take a step back and ask ourselves the question, is this the work that God has called us to do? See, the illustration that Paul's employing here helps us to remind ourselves uh, that we are supposed to be about the work of preaching the gospel, of raising up believers, of holding high the name of Jesus, and to investing in other people. And if what we're doing, if the words that we're speaking or the activity that we're engaged in isn't about building the kingdom, then it's like a soldier who has gotten involved in civilian pursuits. We've lost our primary goal. We have forgotten the reason that we have been commissioned. And the goal that Paul wants Timothy to engage in is very clear from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Actually, it starts in the first verse, first Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so Paul gives Timothy a twofold commission. Like a general in a military, he is giving his lieutenant a direct order. And that's this. It's a twofold order. The first one is to strengthen himself in the grace of Jesus Christ. To engage in the spiritual disciplines necessary to make sure that he has a healthy spiritual life. To make sure that he is regularly engaged in prayer. That he understands the scriptures. That he has fostered and cultivated a good relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the first thing that Paul wants Timothy to do. Not to get distracted by all these other civilian pursuits, but to focus on being strengthened in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the second thing is to take what he has heard Paul preach in the presence of many witnesses and to entrust them to other faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And the context of that is that Paul had taken Timothy aside all those years back when he first came back to Derby and Lystra on his first return visit to those cities and identified this man who he believed had potential and had a good reputation to the other disciples. And he took him under his wing and for years he brought him with him on missionary journeys. And so he's saying, all those things that I taught other people, everything you heard me say in the presence of those witnesses, I want you to entrust to faithful men. I want you to do the same thing. Find someone whom God is laying upon your heart to mentor, to build into, and to encourage. And to teach them that everything that I taught you in the presence of many witnesses, and then help them to pass that on to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And brothers and sisters, that becomes the foundation for a model, a strong model of discipleship throughout church history. See, the reality of the matter is there's really two positive and important elements 
to an effective discipleship ministry. And one is a small group ministry. It's opportunities for people to come together to hear sermons or to hear teaching and to take that information and to embed it in our hearts so that we can grow to be like Christ. And that's one of the reasons why preaching is such an important part of what we do at Baptist Fellowship. It's another reason why Sunday school or small group experiences are so important to our church, because it's opportunities for people to gather together in groups and to learn from the Word of the Lord and to integrate that information. But that's really only one part of a two-part element of discipleship. But the second one is what Paul is instructing Timothy about. Find other people, find individuals, invest your life in one-on-one or one-on-two relationships with people who you believe have the potential to be effective at ministry and to build into them. So there's the group dynamic of Christianity, of church, which is important. It's the place in which corporate worship happens. It's the place in which preaching happens. It's the environment in small groups in which groups come together. But then there's also this one-on-one investment that occurs in the New Testament that's so critical and important to the foundation of the continuation of the work of the gospel. And so my question to you, the first question that we really have to ask ourselves is, are we handling conflict in a way that brings glory to God? This is a contentious season in in our our world's history. It's certainly a contentious season in our nation's history. My question to you is, if you look at uh, the way that you interact with your brothers and sisters or people that you know or your relatives or your brothers and sisters in Christ, or are you following Romans chapter 12? Or have you perhaps gotten entangled in civilian pursuits? You've forgotten that God didn't call you primarily to be an agent of earthly kingdoms, but rather representative of a heavenly kingdom that has not yet come. And if the answer is yes, if you've blown it, then I have great news for you. And the good news is that the first book of John, the first letter of John, In the first chapter, in the ninth verse, the Bible says that if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. My second question that we have to ask ourselves as we finish our time in the Word this morning is who's building into us and who are we building into? So we place a lot of emphasis on being able to gather together in person. And right now, this is one of the situations, this is one of the times in many churches in which we have to be careful about how we gather together in person. And in some senses, we can't gather together in person as often as we want to. And I've heard people say, our church is closed. You can't go to church. And while I understand what they say, what they mean when they say that, the reality of the matter is... uh, even though there may be some prohibitions on us gathering together in person in church, the big group gathering can still happen virtually. It's not ideal. And certainly we're looking to get looking forward to the opportunity to be able to gather together in person. But there's still always the opportunity for us to reach out one-on-one with individuals and to build into their lives and to encourage them and to lift them up. And so my second question as we kind of look at the example of Paul in Acts chapter 16 is this. Who are the people that you're building into? And who is the person who's building into you? Who are the people that you're encouraging and you're helping to grow in Christianity? And who is that one or two people who might be that person for you? And unfortunately, I think for far too many people, they'd say, I don't have anybody who's doing that for me. And I am not doing that for anyone. And I think in order for us to bring our lives into alignment with God's plan, we not only need to have a commitment to the large group gatherings, we also need to have a commitment to being built into from others and being willing to pour out into other people's lives. That that, those mentoring relationships are just as important as the large group gathering. And so if you don't have anyone who's 
building into you, I would perhaps consider, I would urge you to consider uh, maybe thinking of one or two people who you really admire, who you think are good examples of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And if you would have the courage to reach out to them and ask them if you can get together at some point in time, perhaps we have to wait until a quarantine's done and then you can grab a cup of coffee. But just begin the opportunity of exploring what it might be like to have somebody building into you spiritually in a one-on-one relationship. And if you consider yourself a mature Christian, if you've been walking with the Lord for a while, would you ask yourself this question? Who are the one or two people that you're really building into right now? And if the answer is, I don't really have anybody that I'm pouring into, then would you write down and maybe prayerfully consider talking to one or two people and saying, I really see some potential in you, and I'd like to see you grow to be the person that God is shaping you to be, and I really feel like you can be used powerfully of the Lord. Uh, Would you like to get together on a regular basis and see how I can encourage you? Because that's how... Paul and Timothy's relationship became so close and so powerful that it was encouraging to Paul at his greatest moment of need and vital to the life and to the development of Timothy. And the last thing that I'll close with here as we finish our time in sermon this morning is that All of this is buttressed by a reality, and that reality is that we seek to honor Jesus in all that we do. See, the reason that Paul and Barnabas were forced to resolve their conflict in the way that they did, and the reason that Paul then went on in Romans chapter 12 to lay down these principles of what it looks like to get along with brothers and sisters in Christ and those outside is because he wants to bring honor as much as possible to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason that Paul took Timothy aside and began to cultivate this relationship and the reason that he then later explained to Timothy that he wanted Timothy uh, to entrust what he had heard Paul say in the presence of many witnesses to other people, other men who could build into even more men was because he wanted the impact of the Lord Jesus Christ to be magnified. And we as a church are committed at the very core of who we are to proclaiming and preaching the name of Jesus. And so I'll just simply close with this, which is that you can have good relationships, uh, but them not be Christ-like relationships. You can have big gatherings and them have very little to do with who Jesus is. You can resolve conflict, but not resolve conflict in a way that brings honor and glory to Jesus. All of this is about and because and for Jesus. Because God loved the world enough that he sent his only son into the world. That if we believe in him, we won't perish, but we'll have everlasting life. And so I close by asking, have you resolved your conflict with Jesus? And you may be saying, well, I'm not sure I have a conflict with Jesus. Well, if you've ever done anything uh, that has been considered sinful by the Bible, then you have a conflict with Jesus. In fact, it's those very things which caused Jesus to have to take a Roman cross upon himself in order to bleed and die for the remission of sins. If you've ever sinned, you have a problem with Jesus until you take advantage of the ability to come before the cross to receive mercy and forgiveness. Have you done that? And if not, will you get in contact with us so that we can have an opportunity to help you understand more about what it means to receive the fullness of forgiveness in the person of Jesus. And then once you have cultivated that relationship with Jesus, then you have to ask yourself the question, how is my relationship with other brothers and sisters in Christ? Am I in conflict? And if so, maybe the answer this week is to encourage you because of the reputation of Christ and the unity that we have in the body to seek to resolve that conflict. And then the last thing that we see in the word this morning is that what is it like then 
to establish relationships, deep relationships with one or two other people for their benefit and for their upbuilding. And then who's doing that for you? And in many ways, the word relationship ties this entire presentation together. But it's not just relationship for the sake of relationship. It's relationship for the sake of Christ. Can we pray together? Father in heaven, we're so grateful for your grace and for your mercy. And as we round up our time this morning, Lord, I pray that you will invade and heal and affect our relationships. And Father, the first relationship that we need to have affected is our relationship with you. And so, Father, God, we just ask for your forgiveness for every sin and thought and word and in deed that we have committed against you this week, knowing that your word offers us such a precious promise that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Father, we ask God that you will affect and heal our relationships with one another. Lord God, as we look at this relationship between Paul and Barnabas and how it was affected by the differences of opinion, God, help us to breathe in the advice that he gives in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans and with every breath allow that to shape our heart into being the kind of people who to the best of our ability, as far as it depends on us, God, that we live at peace with all men and women. And then, Father, I pray that you will shape us relationally so that we can be encouraged by someone whom you've called to come alongside to help us to grow. And, Father, that we would have the courage to reach out to those who we identify as genuinely needing that encouragement, that we would provide it to them. And may we do all of this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said. Amen.
we hope that you enjoyed your time with us this morning. We're glad that you joined us. Uh, if you have any questions, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach us at www.baptistfellowship.life. And you can also give us a ring at 860-228-0102. May the Lord bring you joy this week as you rejoice in the relationship that you have with Jesus, the relationship you have with others, and those who love you enough to build into your life. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.